Hi everybody, I'm Jack Lally. I'm the uh, city councilor for Ward 6. Thank you all for coming. Um, tonight we're going to talk about, we're going to discuss, just go over briefly the uh, community meeting hosted by Councillor Asak and I yesterday about the, the Father Bill's location, Jack's Place and Patty's House at the corner of uh, North Main Street and Ames Street. Uh, Officer Bill Healy is going to speak a little bit about Neighborhood Watch and then the city's chief financial officer and the school department's chief budget officer, Jay Condon and Aldo Petronio, are going to talk, uh, really take us through the budget a little. All right. Uh, yesterday, we talked about and we, we uh, saw the, the new location, Jack's Place, which is going to be housing, small studio apartments, about 300 square feet, one room, for formerly homeless people, half of them, at least half of them, veterans. And there are several handicapped accessible apartments to go with it, an elevator in it. It's a, uh, it's a pretty good project. I think, I think it'll be, have a positive impact. It's not going to be any kind of shelter. They've got the patio and the sort of relaxing area set up in the back so people aren't concerned about you know everyone lounging around out front and anyone concerned about loitering um, I think it'll be I think it'll be good I think and uh, if if they want to say anything I want to give a, uh, a thanks to State Representative Michelle Dubois and Councillor uh, Wynn Farwell for being here if they if they want to say anything Michelle really got the uh, the ball rolling on this on the Father Bill's location. So any question that I'm not going to be able to answer, she'll probably be able to answer with a little more clarity. Uh, now, if Officer Healy, you you ready? Officer Healy's in charge of uh, the city's neighborhood watch program, so he's going to fill us in on some things you can do there. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Bill Healy. Uh, Appreciate the invite. Today I want, or tonight I wanted to be brief, just to let you know how you can contact me if you want to start a neighborhood watch. And it's very simple. You don't have to write anything down. Go on to the website, Brockton PD website, or the city website, and you'll see Neighborhood Business Watch. All of my contact information is there for you to take down the information. Uh, the drop a uh, dime tip line is also listed on that. That's an anonymous tip line. You could either write or call that number, provide tips, again, by way of email, text, or phone number. We take those tips, or I take those tips, uh, a couple of times during the course of the week. Chief of Police gets them. He delegates the, the tips to the specific areas. As an example, drug issues will go to narcotics. The past couple of months, if you've read the Enterprise, a week has not gone by where there hasn't been guns and or drug arrest. Specifically, two weeks ago, um, there was a big uh, uh, a raid of 60 people across uh, the North Shore, South Shore. Nine people were involved here in the city of Brockton. Several of those people are gonna have been charged federally, which is always a good, uh, a good sign, which usually means when the feds want the case, they win and that means longer jail time. So that's all good news. Many of the tips that were provided, that by the way, that 60 uh, uh, person raid, uh, there was a wiretap going on for many months prior and uh, it paid uh, huge dividends. Um, the tip line, again, you provide those tips. Many of the arrests that you've read about, 
the last X months come from that tip line. Strictly anonymous, and we need people to participate. I'm not gonna know who you are. I always say, I wish I, I keep forgetting to bring a sample, but when you, go on, when you go online and log in that anonymous tip about somebody in your neighborhood that you know might be doing something he or she shouldn't be doing, it generates a number. I'll never even know who you are. That being said, you could also go to the email address, crimewatch at brocktonpolice.com. Once again, on the website, you could write me, and when we get to know each other, Councillor Dubois or State Rep Dubois and the other councillors here, they all realize I get back to them as soon as I can. Strictly anonymous, you'll never be, uh, you'll never have to testify of any, uh, You'll never have to testify on behalf of anything you tell me. Not even a federal court judge could make me reveal the sources. That's how the program is designed. So uh, since January, and I'm gonna do it through the rest of the year, I'm out there pleading with people at the ward meetings I go to and my watch meetings to provide information. You need to act, the police can't do it all. And again, just read the newspaper on a weekly basis and you'll see that we're out there making arrests based on drugs and or guns and all of the other things that we get involved with uh, on a daily basis. So website, all my information, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Unbelievable. Super. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Good question, Gary Leonard. <laughs> Caught him. Um, I received a couple of messages from people who, uh, who would like to be here but were unable to due to uh, prior engagements. Mayor Bill Carpenter, Council President Tim Cruz, and Ward 6 School Committee Woman Joyce Asak all have, uh, they all had to be somewhere else today, but they send, you know, they send their regards. Um, yes, we have a packet about the budget over on that table over there, along with a printout from, that we received yesterday from the Father Bill's meeting, and some water, if anyone wants water. Uh, without, without further ado, I think I can hand over the mic to, uh, to you guys. Uh, thank you, Councillor. For those of you who don't know, I'm Jay Condon, the Chief Financial Officer for the City. And the presentation tonight is based on uh, the handout that's on uh, the table. It looks like many of you have received it. Uh, there's a lot more material in this uh, document than we'll be able to cover tonight, but it's for you to take away. And if you understand it, uh, that's great. If you have questions, you can always call my office or Aldo's office, and we'll take questions tonight. So I'll try to move quickly through what's in front of you. Uh, in that handout so that if there are questions, we have time to get to the questions. So we're going to split the presentation. I'll handle the beginning piece, which is basically an overview of the city's budget and some of the information on the city's budget itself. And after that, I'll hand it off to Aldo, and he'll go through uh, the school budget. So we hope that by the time we're done, we'll have answered most of your questions. Uh, and as I said, we'll try to be reasonably quick so you can uh, ask questions of us. So if you're looking at the handout, the first page in the handout, this is just an assembly of documents that are already in existence that we thought might be helpful for you tonight. Uh, the first page is a letter I send to the City Council and the Mayor uh, every year in, at the time that the budget is submitted, uh, which is required by the law. I have to give an indication as to whether I think the budget as submitted is balanced, and it is, and whether it's sustainable uh, at the level of services that are in the budget over the future, and in that case, for a number of years now, I've said I don't know that we can sustain those services into the future, and the letter gives the reasons why I'm concerned about that. Uh, the biggest issues that we're concerned about, this is still on my letter, have to do with, number one, uh, the fact that the city is so dependent upon state aid for servicing its, uh, its population, and the state, especially in the areas of revenues directed not to the school department but to the city for general fund purposes has been unable to keep pace with the level of support we were getting back about 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, there have been two recessions that the states had to deal with and in dealing with those recessions they reduced state aid in a number of accounts 
as a city with a poor population, an old urban industrial center, we ended up like some of our uh, contemporary cities, Lowell or Lawrence or New Bedford or Fall River, there were disproportionate impacts on the level of assistance to communities like us because we get more assistance from the state because of the formulas which are uh, dependent upon uh, poverty indices. So some of the things we're concerned about is a lack of sufficient capital spending. I think up in this part of the city, a lot of you know that there are problems with respect to the roads. Uh, we're looking at revenues being inadequate to take care of those problems. Lack of sufficient revenues to take care of all of the infrastructure problems we have, especially in the water and sewer departments, where the city is relying on systems that were installed in some cases over 100 years ago or more. And they're, they're reaching the ends of their useful life, a lot of them at the same time, and it's expensive to fix those. We have obligations to take care of the people who work for us today, both in terms of their pensions in the future and in terms of the health insurance uh, providing, we've agreed to provide to them in union contracts. Uh, we're paying as we go on the health insurance as opposed to reserving some of those future costs, and that's a level of concern. Uh, nobody likes to pay taxes. Nobody likes to pay fees. Everybody wishes they didn't have to, but if you don't have taxes and you don't have fees, you don't have services, and the level of revenues that we're willing to pay is not commensurate with the level of services that people are looking to receive, especially with respect to the critical functions of police protection. I think Bill will tell you he feels his department is many, many patrol officers below where it ought to be for a city of this size, and we'd like to have a lot more teachers than we've had. We've had some budget problems in the last few years addressing that. So that's my letter. If you go through a couple more pages, you'll see a, a page which says at the top, fiscal year 2017 budget. Fiscal year 2017 budget uh, for Brockton is heavily influenced by the state. It looks like this. I'll summarize what's on that. Basically, that says that some of what I've just said to you just a few minutes ago, this particular year's budget from the state did a decent job of increasing state aid compared to how revenues in the state have grown for the, uh, for the level of services it isn't affected by uh, our school budget. But it didn't make up for the, the amount of cuts that we received in our budget, especially in 2002 and 2008, our budgeted revenues from the state. And if you'd kept the level of revenues that were in place in 2002 and just put an inflation factor on that of 2 or 3% a year, we'd have another 20 or $30 million more in the budget from the state revenues to support things like uh, public safety or, or capital spending road reconstruction. The state hasn't been able to maintain that level of service. They've got their own budgetary problems uh, with respect to Medicaid costs and other costs up at the state level, and they've got demands on their budget which are greater than the revenue base is to support. So that's, that's the basic problem. On the education budget, this is still on that first page, uh, the one that we were labeled fiscal 2017. On the education budget, the state made a couple of changes in the last few years which have not been good for Brockton. First of all, uh, they are using an inflation factor at the Department of Education, which is this year negative. Um, and the reason it's negative is looking at certain costs which, in fact, on the statewide level did go down. But the costs that our school department supports don't go down. We all know health care costs aren't going down. They're a major part of the school budget. Most of our employees in the school department are on union contracts where there are negotiated raises every year. Those costs are going up even if the state says they're going down, they're not. So using an inflation factor on a formula reduces the amount that comes to the city, and in fact it ought to be increasing. That's a problem. The second problem is that the city receives an awful lot of money every year, like other poor, poor communities do, from the state as extra funding for the cost it takes to educate children who are coming from low-income families because they come to school with many more problems than people who are coming from more advantaged backgrounds, and for special education students. Their formula change this year cost the city of Brockton about $6 million. And you know we're not a community which can afford that kind of a kind of a cut. The legislative delegation has been working hard in the last three to four months to try to get some relief to that change. But the change was imposed in the governor's budget. It wasn't something that the uh, that the uh, legislative delegation was looking to do. But that caused us problems in this budget too. So that's a little bit of an overview. If you go to the next page, it's la la labeled page four. This is just a printout from 
the city's computer programs that we use to develop the budget. City Council gets this every year, it was a, along with those gigantic budget books that they also receive, but this is a bit of a summary for it. And the first page here, which is uh, labeled as page one off the computer program, but at the bottom, the handwritten page number is page four. This shows the general fund budget, not the utilities budget, not the grants budget. It shows the general fund budget as it was submitted by the mayor to the city council at the beginning of the month of June. And it shows it for four fiscal years. And the first three years you can see are in surplus. That's because at the time we submit the budget, it's balanced. But during the course of the year, some of our revenue estimates generate more money, or we don't spend all of it, and those show a surplus. But for the present, the budget we submitted to the city council was balanced. This is what the city council received. When they did their deliberations, they made some cuts to this number, so it's a little bit less than that because of the cuts they made. The, the spending authority is a little bit less. But basically, you can see on the right side, it's in balance. Page number four. Okay. So... <clears throat> If you, uh, I'm going fast through this so you can ask, ask questions. If you flip to the next page, you saw on the page we just left, $364 million in spending and $364 million in revenues. This page shows you how that $364 million in revenues is comprised. It has the cherry sheet is the state aid. Uh, available funds are basically the use of reserves, uh, not estimated revenues, but cash in the bank. Uh, the next line is for local receipts. That's licenses and permits, uh, motor vehicle excise tax, a whole variety of programs go into that $24 million number. And the final one is the tax levy total, which is $128.7 million. So you can see out of $364 million worth of spending in the general fund, including schools, $192 million of that money comes from the state. So when I say we're very dependent on whether the state is generous to us or not, that's the reason why. That's better than half of the uh, general fund budget comes from state revenues. So we're very dependent on them. That's, that's the revenue budget at a high level of detail. They're in the books that we give to the council. There's a lot more supporting detail than that. I didn't bring it tonight. If anybody of you are interested, this, bu this booklet in its entirety is posted on the city's website, as are the budget books that the city councilors work with. So any of that information is available for you for inspection on the website, and my office will take any phone calls you've got to ask what, what does it all mean. The next page shows the expenditure budget at a high level. This is labeled page uh, six in the, in the handout. Looks like this, starts with appropriations, total is at the top. So spending in the city's budget is, com is made up of three different kinds of spending in the general fund. The first are appropriated spending totals. Those are acted on by the city council. There's another category called state and county, uh, county charges, which the city council and the city have nothing to do with. It's basically calculated by the state, and those charges are deducted directly out of the money they send us for state revenue. And the third charge is something called other amounts to be raised. Uh, that also doesn't go to the city council for appropriation. Some of it has to do with special kinds of uh, state revenues that go directly, say, to the library committee or to school lunch. And the final piece has to do with a category called the overlay. Basically, the overlay is a set aside of anticipated tax revenues because during the course of the year, we grant abatements on assessments because people object to the level of assessing, assessing in the, of their homes. And if they can make the case, the assessors will reduce the assessment on that home. That results in a loss, of, a loss of tax revenue. We have to pay for that. There are exemptions for the elderly, for the disabled, for veterans. All of those show up in that $2.8 million. So you can see there's $364 million of spending and $364 million of revenue. That's why I said the city uh, budget was, uh, was balanced. The next page looks at the appropriated revenues again by categories. I haven't given you a departmental breakdown here, but it looks at broad categories that cut across departments. For example, the city at the very top looks like this. It's the very next page. The city spending about $2,559,000 in budgeted overtime. Now, some of that was cut by the city council, but that was the initial submission, $2.5 million for overtime. Over $57 million in salaries. That's not school, that's city side salaries. And of that, 
44, 45 million is dedicated to the police and fire department. So almost all of those salary costs are being spent by the city's police and fire department. That's the most important uh, focus of the city in its budget, not the education. The education is different, but for, for the city appropriations, the bulk of it goes to public safety. Uh, we've got $6 million in purchase of services, another $6 million, $7 million rather, $6 million for buying goods. You can see there's $18 million in pension cost. That's an assessment from the state that we have to pay for people who have already retired. Uh, $14.5 million for borrowing that we've done over the years we've got to pay back. You can see a large number there for the health insurance budget, which is over $53 million. And it goes on and on until you get down to the bottom, which shows $178.5 million goes to the school department or to Southeast Regional uh, School District. Both, both of those are in there. And the final section, which I want to show you, also from that computer printout, this doesn't have details, but it shows you we have um, five, I think, uh, functions which are funded primarily by user fees and are supposed to be self-supporting. Uh, of them, most are, a couple aren't. So you can see there's the recreation enterprise. Most of those revenues come from the golf course. The golf course is fully self-sufficient, but it also tries to support our parks and recreation program other than the golf course. And in that case, there is a subsidy from the general fund because there's not enough golf revenues to run the golf course, plus the parks and recreation program. The subsidy from the general fund is about a million dollars that's embedded in that, uh, in that money. Uh, there's a refuse enterprise fund as well. That's fully self-sufficient. Uh, there's uh, those of you who live on the east side I think are familiar perhaps with the uh, solar field off Grove Street uh, that so-called bright field that fund is self-sufficient in its operating cost and that generates about a hundred thousand dollars in revenues and expenses every year there is a sewer fund at uh, 20 million dollars that fund is self-sufficient and then there's the water enterprise fund that fund is no longer self-sufficient it's a fund that should in my opinion should take care of itself with fees it doesn't uh, and because of that we've not had the same level of capital that we needed in the past uh, and it's an old system that needs the money there are also expenses in all of these utility funds which are carried in the general fund and then are supposed to be reimbursed by these utility funds because the ratepayers, not the taxpayers, ought to be covering those. But to the extent that it's not able to, the general fund doesn't get reimbursed. And the water fund owns, owes the general fund about $2 million. So that's an overview. I know it's really, really quick. That's an overview of the, of the city's uh, budget. I'll give a quick introduction to the next page, which is the school budget, and then Aldo can take over. <coughs> The, the page that says Brockton Public Schools shows you fiscal 17, it shows you the superintendent's request, the school committee's action on the superintendent's request, and then what the mayor has submitted to city council. And there are two categories there, net school spending and non-net school spending. Uh, those are kind of technical terms for Massachusetts. Net school spending is money that is spent on basically on classroom, direct classroom services, or costs that support those direct classroom services. And the non-net school spending is basically for the transportation of school children to and from school. That's how those two numbers, that's basically what's in those two numbers. You can see that in the fiscal 16, the total was a little over 172 million. Uh, the superintendent was looking for almost 179 million. The school committee reduced that to 175 million, uh, not for the non-net, just for the net school spending. Uh, the mayor has submitted $176 million to the city council. Uh, I'm sorry, $174 million, $955 to the city council. And the city council approved all the spending that the mayor requested for the school department. So it's a little bit above where it was in fiscal 16, but it's uh, not sufficient to have maintained all the positions in the school department this year. And you know, the layoffs are as a result of the in inadequacy of that, that budget. So I'll give, it to, I'll give it to Aldo, and we'll go back and take questions once we've gone through all sure. of them. Sure. Good evening. I'm Aldo Petronio from the school department. Um, if you flip over a couple more pages, page 11, I'll kind of do the same overview that you just had. Um, school department revenues that come from the general fund are just that. That does not include any of the grants that we might receive from the state, Title I, Title II, such as that. So we requested 175 or so million from the mayor, and what the best the mayor could do for us this year was 167 million. So when he gives us that figure, we try then to bring that into our budget and balance our budget from that amount. 
Um, it breaks out to about 119 million in certified staff. Certified is anyone that carries a teaching license. About 22.7 million in non-certified. That's all the secretaries, custodians, the paraprofessionals, the rest of the staff, anyone that's not licensed by the state to be a teacher. Ordinary maintenance is 25.6 million. That covers all our costs to maintain all of our buildings, heating, electricity, you know, the outside grounds trucks, everyone else, um, all the supplies and maintenance uh, for, the, for the operation. And then out-of-state travel, which is something contractual with our teachers. They're allowed to go to um, conferences for, they have to maintain their licenses, so there's conferences they have to go to sometimes. Um, so we maintain $20,000 separate in the budget because that's contractual for their purposes. So basically, we have to work to balance our budget to zero. And the way that happens is by cutting back as many of our expenses as possible, and then also, unfortunately, having to lay um, staff off, which is what we did last year and again this year. Because as Mr. Khan explained to you, the, f the, the funds from the state are not um, adequate to meet our needs. Brockton has been receiving less and less of those funds every year. And that's what the campaign that you've all been seeing, Brockton Kids Count, I'll get into that in a minute about why. Um, every year I anticipate 2 to 3% increase from the state in our, it's called Chapter 70. That's the law that sends us our money. This year we did not receive 2 or 3%. We received 0.02% of an increase, which doesn't even cover um, our electricity bills. Next page is a little more detailed picture of our budget. It goes through, the, this is page 12, the top section. We break out our certified staff. So the cost of the high school staff, the middle school staff, the elementary staff. It goes through administration, that's your, you know, your principals, your vice principals, your school committee. We break out nurses and psychologists. Um, the, 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 they're broken up because both of those line items, like nurses and psychologists, are something that we cannot cut. If you have a school open, you need a nurse there. You can't just cut it out. Psychologists, same thing, we're mandated on special ed plans to have them available. Um, athletic programs, professional development, again, teachers have to maintain their license. We have to provide them with each year with the um, professional development opportunities to maintain their licenses. And then the rest is, you know, substitute teachers. Earn credits is because teachers are required to have a master's degree within five years. So the pay scale is set up um, to start out basically at a bachelor's degree but within five years you have to get to a master's. So as they move up the scale, that earned credits covers that cost that we build in. Um, some people go quicker on it, some people go slower, but that's how we cover that piece of the budget. Um, and then of course, the very end of it, unemployment and workers' compensation, just like any other business, if someone gets hurt, we have to cover the cost. If we, if we lay someone off, we have to cover their costs. So that budget um, seems pretty high, and the reason is because the past two years we've laid off you know, roughly 75 individuals um, between teachers and custodians and secretaries. So we have to cover those costs in, in those years' budgets. The next section is the non-certified. As you can see, there's paraprofessionals, custodians, police. Um, you'll also see in there additional personnel. Both budgets have some money in additional personnel. We never know how many students are gonna be here September 1st. We know what we ended with in June, June 30th, the last day of school, but during the course of the summer, for the past many years, we have seen students moving in. Um, we were at 15,000 students about four years ago, five years ago. We're now at 18,000 students. As they come in, you have to bring in more teachers and more support staff. There's no way to know how many are gonna be here. There's, uh, they, you know, they arrive, the law says you have to educate them. So we reserve a little bit of money. Um, it's not enough, but a little bit of money in both the certified and non-certified to cover those costs. The next section is the ordinary maintenance. Those are our books, our supplies, our textbooks, our, you know, our, our biggest cost, electricity, water, natural gas, um, running all of it. We have 25 buildings in total, I think 23 schools, a warehouse, uh, central office. So we have 25 buildings all being maintained. As you can imagine, Brockton High School alone, I think the electricity bill alone is over a million dollars for that school. But that school does run almost 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, you go by there 11 o'clock at night, you still see people in there, whether it's, you know, uh, basketball games finishing up or just people working in the building, and then it's open again. They're there between 5.30 and 6 o'clock in the morning. So it's, it's barely down. Um, and luckily, we, it's a great school. We have no issues, no problems there. We do a lot of maintenance. There's quite a few custodians in that building have to maintain that property. 
Uh, and the last item again was that out-of-state travel, that's something that's contractual. So in developing this budget, we try and estimate, um, again, the biggest piece, about 80, 85% of it is salaries. So we estimate with whatever contracts have been settled by the school committee, that increase from one year to the next, and that's how we built our proposal for the mayor as to what we need funded in the, in the following year budget. Next page, page 13, basically showing how, how, how um, I'm sorry, the next page is, is our, our non-net school spending, or I, a lot of times I refer to it as our busing budget. So every year we request money for our buses. We have about 50 buses and about 50 vans, roughly, that transport our children around town. We have about 9,000 children that we transport out of almost 18,000, so almost half of them are transported to school. If you're a special ed and it's, and it's in your IEP, your individual education plan, that you have to be picked up at your door, we have vans to pick it up. We have time limits as to, far, as to how long someone can be on a van or a bus. You can't have them on there for an hour and a half. Um, so we set up our routes probably about 10 years ago or maybe eight years ago. We changed from one or two tiers of busing to three. So the high school kids go first, when the buses are done, then they go to the middle school, when they're done, then they go to the elementary. That brought us from about 75 buses down to about 50 buses by making that change. Now it's a little more inconvenient for the students, but we had no choice, we had to cut our budget. So in this proposed budget here, um, we put in what the city level funded us on the appropriation. We have some sources that help fund some of the special education children. Uh, numbers three, four, Five are all additions that um, we're expecting in the state budget. Some McKinney Vento is our homeless children. We have between five and 600 of them. So the state is supposed to provide us additional revenues to educate them and also additional revenues to transport them. We built those into our budget. Charter school, at the time we built the budget, we didn't know where the charter school was going to be. Although they receive our funding for the children that they take, the city is responsible to transport the children. So that cost is part of the busing. So We've budgeted for three buses at the time of the budget. It appears now, because they're centrally located downtown, that our busing schedule is such that if you're uh, within two miles, you walk. So because they're centrally right on Main Street, we were able to hopefully cut three buses back out of here, um, and probably we'll have just one bus that's able to pick up all the children that are outlying in the city. They just this past week gave us a list of about 100 students. Um, they were entitled to take 315 according to their charter. So again, we don't know, we won't know until September how many buses we really need to pick up their students. Now, one question, back to charter schools for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a dollar figure on the, on the impact on your budget that the charter school will have? Well, they can take up to 315 students and our chapter 70 is about 11,400 this year per student. So you're talking three and a half million, almost $4 million is what they could potentially pull out of our, our coffers. The first year, the state will hold us harmless. They'll give you know, three and a half million to the charter and they'll give three and a half million to us. And then in the course of a, uh, four years, they'll, they'll wind that down to about 25%. So it gives us time to basically lay off staff pay the unemployment costs, and make the changes we need to make. So, like I said, as of right now, the charter school, I think, has about 100 actual parents who have signed up. Um, they're slated to open late August, so we have to just wait and see how that, uh, again, it's another unknown cost until we know it. Their capacity is what, 315? 315 is their charter. And then it goes up 105 students a year um, until they can reach, I think it's 775. They're grade six, seven, and eight. They'll go all the way to grade 12. So. Okay. Uh, at the bottom of the page we're just leaving, you'll notice there's about a half a million, almost $600,000 difference between that budget and uh, what they think they'll need. So that's a problem that's going to have to get solved as more information becomes available to us between now and next September when schools open. You know, we don't quite know yet how we're going to do it, whether it will be a reduction in the number of buses that the school department wants, or whether we'll provide additional assistance from what will probably be additional state aid from uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we're hoping from, for that, or we may need to find another source of local revenues to, to, to fix it. Do you anticipate additional layoffs because of that? No, 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 no I don't. I think that's, that's done. 
That's done. Okay. So the next page, labeled uh, 14, uh, this is a page, I'll spend a few minutes on this. Uh, this is a page which is intended to show that the city's development of its education budget is compliant with the law of uh, the Education Reform Act and how we do it. So if you look at the, uh, at the before I go into the detail, the, the, the most important thing to understand about the Education Reform Act is that it splits the costing of what every student is supposed to get for an education under the Education Reform Act from the source of revenue to pay for it. Those are two separate calculations. So on what every student is supposed to get, they build a budget, what's called the foundation budget, and it starts with a level of cost for a bunch of categories, you know, health insurance, uh, electricity, teacher salaries, all the kinds of costs that go into an education budget. Those costs differ depending upon the category of student so that an elementary student is cheaper to educate according to the statute than a high school student. And then there are additional funds provided in this formula that are supposed to come to the school districts if a student is from a low income family or if the student has special needs, all those costs are supposed to be additional funding sources. Then how you count for it is a separate calculation and the cities and towns of Massachusetts are allowed to count not just cost that are directly appropriated to the school department, but also costs that might be in the city's budget that are appropriate for looking at as they are supporting the cost of educating kids. For example, in the city's budget is the cost of all of the health insurance, including school teacher health insurance. That's a countable cost. In the city's budget is the cost of pensions for non-teacher staff, uh, not for the Brockton Education Association because they get paid for by the state pension system, but for the non-teaching staff, those pensions are attributable to them. Almost all of our employees now, because of the um, Tax Reform Act of 1986 in, uh, at the federal level, almost all of our employees now have to pay for the Medicare tax. Brockton employees, all Massachusetts employees who are in government do not get Social Security and we don't pay a Social Security tax but we do qualify for Medicare, and so the city has to pay the Medicare tax for anybody who's been hired or rehired since 1986. So today, that's almost everybody. So we have a substantial Medicare tax bill that goes to the federal government. That gets to be counted, and that's in the city's budget. The cost for charter schools and the reimbursement for what we, of what we get from that from the state, that's also in the city's budget. So that's all calculated on a schedule that's called Schedule 19. It goes to the state from the local communities. And so those costs that are in the city's budget, we get to pick up and say, these costs are already provided for by the city, so what we've got to give you under the foundation budget first deducts these costs. And that's, that's what this page is intended to show you. So just in kind of quick detail, you will see over on the left-hand side, it shows the foundation budget. That's for fiscal 17. We get that from the state. It's based on our enrollment as it existed in October. They calculate this on that foundation budget costing approach I just mentioned by the number of students, by grade and kind of student on that basis. That's 209 million almost. Two, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, that's for, I'm, I'm sorry, FY16. That's the FY16 number. Yeah, if we go down through, you'll see it. So the pure pupil on that, that's just $11,800 per. You can see the foundation budget, that's the kids back in 2016, $17,694. $17, uh, there's a growth factor applied to that to provide an additional per pupil cost. And then there's a slight reduction in, uh, and that, that's less than a percent. There's a slight reduction in our enrollment, only 20 kids from one year to the next. But they changed the calculations on how they would count low-income students, and that's why you see this difference of $202.9 million for fiscal 17 compared to $209 million, almost $209.5 million in fiscal 16. That was what we were talking about at the beginning of the presentation, which is how they changed at the state level calculating low-income student enrollment and the, the change disadvantaged the city of Brockton. So we're actually on the foundation budget six and a half million dollars less this year than we would have been last year because of that change primarily. The state <clears throat> did not want to see communities like Brockton lose six and a half million dollars in one year. So they made up the difference there in order to avoid that and so we end up with a $210 million allocation from the state. But our concern is 
that that's a kind of gift at this point, and until we get either an amendment to that law or get in compliance with what that law expects as to how we count low-income students, we're at risk for that money each year because it's not really part of the foundation budget anymore. So that's the top part. Um, the middle part just shows how we come down to what we, we need to spend. Coming out of last year, we were $1,860,000 below where we were supposed to be. We have to make that up under the state law. If you didn't make your spending obligation in one year, you got to carry that shortfall forward to the next year. As long as you're within 95%, there's no penalty to you. So that was well less than, you know, 95% of $200 million. That would have been, you know, almost $10 million. So we only were short by about 2%, not 5%. But we had to carry it forward. There's a minimum contribution out of local revenues. That's calculated uh, community by community by the state, and it's dependent upon how does your community look with respect to the rest of the state in terms of its property values, and how does your community look compared to the rest of the state uh, with respect to income. And those two level, uh, two different formulas are blended together to get what's considered to be your minimum local recontribution. That's basically coming out of the property tax, folks. That property tax revenue has to be de dedicated to the school department. And then that's the total required spending. Then from that, you get to deduct what I said before was on Schedule 19. And that's about $45.5 million. Over to the right, you can see what's in that Schedule 19. What I want to show you that's in that is there's about $6 million a year going to either school choice, which is primarily Avon or West Bridgewater taking Brockton kids in, or to charter schools. And before we even had this downtown charter school, we had children leaving Brockton, going to other charter schools in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I think primarily in Foxborough, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And we also pay uh, uh, tuition to um, uh, Norfolk agricultural schools, Brockton kids are allowed to go there. This doesn't uh, include Southeast Regional, that's separately calculated. But anyway, that's, that's the way all of that's developed. At the end of the day, we had an obligation to spend $167 million this year, and the mayor met that obligation and added a little bit to it, and the council uh, approved that budget of $167.4 million to the school department. The next section I'm not going to go through every page. It basically goes through what Mr. Condon just explained. When the state determines Chapter 70, they, they, they first begin by setting what's called the foundation budget. Back in 1993, they passed an ed reform law that basically said that every child in the state should receive the same level of education, no matter if you live in Wellesley or Weston or whether you live in Brockton. So in doing that, the state sets what they consider a minimum dollar spent on every student. So that is what determines your foundation budget. So in doing so, the state determines that for 351 different uh, school districts within the state. When they come up with that figure, they then look at the cities and towns and say, how much can they afford to pay on their own? So a place like Wellesley or Weston may pay 85% of their school budget out of their own tax base, out of their own, their own citizens. Brockton, on the other hand, like Lowell and, and Worcester, we receive almost 80% from the state. So they'll send us 80% of it, the city kicks in the other 20%. But Can you give those numbers? What's the state versus city numbers? It's about $170 million from the state this year and about 40, 45 million from the city. Thank you. Those are off the top of my head, but it's around there. So the state gives us that $170 million. But part of that is we have to spend and meet that minimum obligation. So if they say it's $210 million this year, we must spend $210 million. If we fall below that, we have to make it up next year. If we fall more than 5% uh, below that, we get penalized. And again, the reason being is they want to make sure that the children in Brockton are receiving the same level of effort and education as uh, students anywhere else in the Commonwealth. So the next four or five pages will go through and explain. When they look at that, they look at your tax base. They look at the average median income of your city or town. They look at how the city or town generates revenues. For example, if you think about Boston, Boston has a huge financial district. They have a huge industrial district. They have waterfront. They have a means of bringing in a lot of money to help fund their costs. Brockton, on the other hand, we have a very small industrial area. We're primarily a bedroom community. We primarily have homes. Going back 100 years ago, we had 
factories and a rail service through here, and we had many businesses, a lot of operations. We were able at that, back then to probably have paid more. This didn't exist, but we had that. But over time, we've, we have become less and less industrialized and more of a suburban community, although we're urban. Go to a town like Easton, Easton, the taxpayers have to front most of their, their bills. They don't have, they've got a small industrial park. They don't have what we have. Avon, I think, is what, half and half? The industrial park in Avon pays half of their tax bill. Again, Brockton doesn't have that ability. So there's a formula, this Chapter 70 formula goes through and looks at all those abilities and at the same time looks at your makeup of students. You get so much money for a regular red student, then they add on, if they're bilingual, they add on, if they're low income, they add on, if they're special needs, they add on for each of those. Every one of our students' data is sent to the state, I think three times a year. And they'll go through and that's how they determine how much money to send you. Now the part I mentioned earlier, I said I get to now, is this economically disadvantaged students. You might have heard that before, that's what kicked off this whole campaign of our Brockton Kids Count. Last year, they looked at all of our students and they looked at our free and reduced lunch forms. And 81% of our children were considered poor, were considered low income from the free and reduced lunch forms. Doesn't mean they had no income, just meant they felt below a certain guideline. So because of that, we would receive funding for those students as low income. Come FY17, the governor decided to change the formula and use something called economically disadvantaged. They're looking to streamline, get out of the paper business of filling out lunch applications. What they did was they looked at any student or any family that's on state assistance. So by doing so, we went from 81% low income down to 55% low income. That in funding cost us almost six million dollars. So again, as Mr. Condon said, the state held us harmless on that for the first year, but it also didn't give us any increase. Holding us harmless and giving us level funding is like giving me, me or giving the school department a three or four million dollar cut. So that's what our state delegation has been working very hard on. Um, Mike Brady, uh, Michelle Dubois, Claire Cronin, Jerry Cassidy, they have been working at the state level to try and get additional funding. Now, in the House budget and in the Senate budget, it looks like there's additional funding. We won't know until they sell that budget. If, if not, we get that. It's not going to be a lot, but it will be, be a something. million dollars. It'll be a million. Yeah. I was hoping That's for That's a lot of money. Well, I was hoping for four, but I know. yes. Yeah. But the so. city could make that up as well. The city could have allocated that money if they really wanted to. Well, that's, right. the, that's up to the mayor. The very last page, page 25, I just want to show you briefly how that works. What page 25 I put together here, on the top shows FY17, our money from the state, and the bottom shows FY16. What this shows is how they allocate the funds. It's broken out by uh, half-day kindergarten, full-day kindergarten, elementary students, middle school students, high school students. And then they break it out according to the different um, areas within the budget they fund, administration, instruction, classroom specialists. It all breaks out this whole formula. But the section I want you to see is the section in yellow on the top. It says economically disadvantaged on there. That says we have 9,803 students that the state considers economically disadvantaged or low income. They go and they fund it and they give us $40 million, $40,535,000 for those children. Last year, if you look on the, the bottom section in the, in the beige or the pink area, it was considered low income. And the state had there over 14,000 kids, because you add the 9,000 plus the 5,000 broken out, because they had elementary and other is, is the uh, middle school and high school kids. We had 15,000 kids last year. This year we have 9,800. Last year we received 46.4 million. And again, this year we're receiving 40.5 million. So almost $6 million less. So our goal right now, since the state formula is not going to change, our goal right now is to reach out to the public and try and help and assist anyone that might be entitled to any sort of state benefits. Because if you can get on any one of those state benefits, in turn, it'll benefit the schools. It'll bring money in. Now there are families that are too proud to go on state benefits. There are families that work and make money, they just don't make a lot. So they might have four children, five children, 
which brought them free lunch according to the standards the feds had set for, for free lunch or reduced lunch. But now this new formula looks at only those people who are on state assistance, which is SNAP, um, uh, Mass Health, uh, I think WIC, if you're on Medicaid, that's all it's looking at. So we're going to hopefully help people identify those families that should either be in those programs or need to be in those programs. We're also, since this is new statewide, the state, all these agencies within the state don't all really communicate with one another. So we may have two students living in a house with two different last names. So one student might be directly identified as being on state assistance, but the other one, the last name doesn't match up or it's not listed. We have to go through and manually make an adjustment and then tell the state that we have two people in the same households that are entitled to this benefit. It's a longer process for us to go through, but that's what we're going to try and do and make up some of these funds and hopefully get ahead of the game um, for the next budget if, if that's possible. Hopefully the state doesn't change the formula and lower it to us. So that's been the big um, push that you've seen now with the Brockton Kids Count. Our argument is we want you to count every child that's in the classroom. Just because you don't have them on some state assistance program does not mean they're not there and does not mean that they're not entitled to ed the education that they're entitled to, that Ed Reform of 1993 says that they receive. And that Ed Reform, for anyone that doesn't know it, Brockton brought that lawsuit back in 1993 against the state. And it took, what, 10 years? Started in the early 80s. Started in the early 80s, and 93 was decided. But it took almost 10 years to sue the state and win the battle that the state had to then go and allocate their funds such that every student received an equal education. The reason we're back in this situation now is because costs within the structure, like health insurance and salaries, have gone beyond what the state is funding properly. And we may have to look at doing it again, but it's a long battle. So, um, and with that, I guess we're open for questions. Any questions? So you were saying that um, you know the state looks at the low-income families. When, when families are filling out the free lunch forms, isn't there a section that says something about mass health and um, uh, there is SNAP and all that other stuff? Yes. So basically, when you're filling out a, a lunch application form, you don't have to put down any income or, or, or work information. If you're on a state program, you could check that off and you're automatically included. But like I said, there are a lot of families that maybe they make $30,000 for the year, but they have four children. I'm doing the numbers in my head. I think that got them free lunch. Whereas now, they're not on any state program. They're, like I said, they're probably too proud. There's also people that aren't here, you know, um, undocumented. So they're afraid to fill out any forms. But they would fill out a lunch form because for years we reached out to them and let them know that filling out this form is not going to cause any sort of government agency to come look for you. So if you're undocumented, you're not being recognized. But federal law says if they show up on our doorsteps, we have to educate them. We have to take them in. So this is basically, I think, the state right now is, is not properly funding us because they should fund us for those students. First of all, thanks for coming out. I know this is a complicated um, situation and it's hard to make it clear. Jay, I know the Government Finance Officers Association has a movement where they try to have cities do kind of consumer or citizen friendly budgets. Some cities are putting pie charts up, you know, this is your dollar and this is how we allocate it. So folks can kind of look and see the flow of taxes and expenditures. So my first question is, do you think we ever might get to that point where that's put up? The second yep. question is, on that $364 million, really and truly, how much is fixed cost and how much is discretionary? Well, on the first question, uh, for many, many years we did create those pie charts. I didn't do it on this year's budget, but if you look on uh, the budget presentations for previous years, we just, we just didn't get to it this year. Uh, we have charts that show where does your money come from and where does your money go to. And it's basically taking the information that was in this handout and making it visual as opposed to tables. Uh, so we, we could do that again if folks think it's help, helpful. Put it up on the website. Yeah, yeah put it up on the website, yeah. But it, it, it's out there for every year prior to this fiscal year. Uh, the second question is, um, I'm not going to try to answer it with, uh, with a quick run through, but if we look back at that 
presentation, uh, probably about page, in terms of the numbered pages, looks like seven. So the, the fixed cost of the 364, the state and county charges, that's a little over $8 million, that's fixed. Uh, the uh, amounts to be raised, that was about $2.8 million, that's not shown on this particular page, that's fixed. Now you're looking at the appropriated budget, there's $352 million there. Remember, the overtime is, is discretionary, but kind of not, but it's, technically it's discretionary. Remember I said of the 57.4 million in salaries, it's the second line on that table, 45 million of that is police and fire. Uh, it isn't fixed because you could have a smaller police or fire force if you chose to, but I don't think the citizens of Brockton would put up with that. Um, some of the expenses are not fixed. You know, you don't have to buy as many papers or supplies. That, there's some discretion in that. That's seven million, six million in, um, so maybe 13 between purchases of goods and services. Maybe 10% of that you'd have some flexibility with in, in really tightening your belts. Come down to the pension number, 18.7 million, fixed. Treasurer's debt service, most of that's for projects where we built schools or bought uh, repair programs for schools, fixed. $54 million uh, for health cost. Pretty much fixed. We gotta pay the retirees unless we negotiate a change. We have over the years, uh, when Winthrop Farwell was mayor, uh, the city paid about 95% of the cost of employees' health care. And the employees paid about 5%. And when Farwell was mayor, when we got from that to 10% and then to 20%, and since then, we've got it up to 25%. But that's through bargaining, uh, and we don't simply put a gun to the union's heads and say, you're going to give us this. We've got to sometimes it's money that they get in salaries or something else to pay for it. But we've done what we can on that. It's not easy to get there, but we've gone from, if you think about it, that's really probably a 60-something million dollar total cost of which the city's paying 64 million. What if we were paying 65 million instead of 54 million. Those concessions from the unions are worth about 10 million, but what's there now in the short term is fixed. It's not fixed over the long haul because you can negotiate it, but in the short haul it's fixed. Those other single purchase appropriations, that's like snow and ice removal, it's like street lights. The point of my, I guess your question is, do we really have a lot that we can play with? The answer to that isn't much. And so of that $365 million, when people say you ought to be able to find $5 million or $4 million or $3 million in that budget, the answer is yes, you can, but not without pain, because most of that, most of that money is going to things people don't want to see cut. We don't, my, my view of, of municipal budgeting in a nutshell is you've got to do as much as you can to find flexibility in what is an inflexible system. Your costs are mainly salaries, they're mainly unionized salaries, their direct services for the most part, those people are, you know, there's a few in City Hall that are behind the scenes, but most of the money that is being spent is going to people who are in the highway department or the teachers or to police and fire. That has to be provided if you're really going to be having a city and you don't have a lot of flexibility. And then on the revenue side, it's also inflexible. You're getting half of your revenue from the state where you don't have an awful lot of influence. You're getting Oh, what does it say, 120 something million dollars in tax levy. Uh, there's some are not spending in the tax levy, but people, people in Brockton don't want to pay more taxes. There aren't a lot of wealthy people in Brockton. We're not looking at a millionaire city here. It's hard to get them to find more money there. And to get more money out of the citizens, for the most part, it's a referendum. We've tried it a couple times in Brockton, and people aren't anxious to pay more taxes. So highly inflexible cost, very inflexible revenue, when there's a problem, like in 2002 or 2008, where you get, end up with revenues being squeezed on you, where do you go to find the savings? It's hard to find them. That's why when you get those cuts, they end up being, we gotta fire people. That's the problem. So I think that's kind of the answer to your question, Lynn. And what, why do you think the city look at uh, other alternative methods to save money? One example, if you touch on the, the healthcare costs, uh, a few years ago, Plymouth County Commissioner Sam Wright approached the city with an offer to join the Plymouth County Commission. The, uh, the, the group insurance, uh, state group insurance, uh, I have a paper here, but uh, basically, if, if the city of Brockton signed up with the state, 
they can save over eight million dollars on our health costs. They have approximately five thousand city employees right now with, with health insurance. Now, if they sign up with the state, it jumps up to four hundred fifty thousand. The substantial savings there. There is a slightly higher co-payment, but on the other end of the equation, the monthly premiums are much much lower. And there's eight million dollars that the city can save. Them. The city seems very reluctant to, to make to make any change. Hear all that question, but I think the, 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 the essence of your question is that I'm sorry, go ahead. A couple of years ago, to uh, at the end of Linda Bell's auditorium, I, I was at the meeting in December when every 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 department had come up with a tale of woe that they're going to have lay, lay off so many people and almost in tears. So they got what they wanted, and then before the meeting concluded, the, the city council approved a ten thousand pay dollar pay raise across the board for every every department head. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, like there's an old saying, I was born at night, but not last night. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know the answer to the, to the second question you're talking about. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about there. The first thing you were talking about had to do with why hasn't the city changed its present health insurance system to join up with the state? Was that the question? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we propose to the city council that we do that. City council uh, was... Uh, the city's unions were objecting to that. City council said, "You can." Yeah, I'm sorry. No, that, that, that's the main reason. Well, I, I, I'm not going to characterize characterize why they made the vote, but they chose not to accept that legislation and said instead, "Go back to negotiate this benefit change with the unions." We did. We saved a substantial amount of money, but we didn't save all that we could have saved had we joined with the state system. The big difference there has to do with annual deductibles. That's basically the difference. So that, that was why that happened. I called it, um, both council, uh, state rep Dubois and I voted on that, but as a result of voting, it saved $20 million when the unions went back to the table with the city of And Rockford. I have a report that was done by an um, economic group that found that. So that isn't just me writing it down on paper. It's a 20-page report that looked at the negotiated um, health costs that the unions were able to do, and it saved that much money. And I'm happy to show it to anybody here. It and, did. It, sa it yeah. saved a lot of money and and over the years. Every any year the city can do it. So what, what the city council said is we believe in unions and we're going to give you a chance to bargain in good faith and if you don't do a good enough job, we're going to push you onto the GIC. We had faith in our city unions and they came back and they saved a lot of money. Mm -hmm. If they hadn't, we could have pushed them on to the GIC. And if this new city council feels as though that's what they want to do, they can do that. I know that I would never do that if the union is negotiating in good faith and saving dollars. Mm -hmm. So I just take a little bit of an exception. Well, I, all I think all I, I think all I said, uh, Representative Dubois, was that the unions objected and the city council heard their argument. That's all I said. We did go back to the table. We saved a substantial amount of money. The difference in the plans today between the GIC plans and what we negotiated with the unions is basically the existence of an annual deductible in the GIC plans that doesn't exist in the city plans. We got what we were able to get with the city unions. It was done in a collaborative fashion. We now have a public employee committee that we bargained with, and that system's in place in, through 2018. And I, I don't dispute the fact that there was money saved, nor do I dispute the fact that there was a good result there. All I'm saying is that the GIC plans would have saved a little bit more money. That's all. Uh, Mr. Petroni, I just had a question. In uh, FY 2016, the substitute teacher budget was 708000 uh, This year, the recommended or the local budget is double that. Did that number go over in 2016 so we had to pay more than that 708000 That budget has always been around $1.4, million, $1.5 And in the past two budget cycles prior to this, in an effort to save teaching positions, we cut that budget back, the, the, the school committee cut that budget back down to the 700, actually it was down to 600,000 at one point um, in an effort to save it. What we found is that there were too many students ending up in cafeterias and having no coverage for their classrooms. So this year the priority of the school committee was to make sure that there was a substitute for every class, that we minimize the number of students sitting in cafeterias. So we put that budget, the, the school committee asked me to put that budget back to where it belongs. Um, and I, of course, added about $100,000 in there for inflation costs. 
um, so that starting September, we'll be able to offer substitute teachers from you know, K through 12 across the system and minimize the number of children that are literally sitting in a cafeteria. So it was the school, I'm sorry, it was the school committee's uh, decision to... The, the superintendent put it forward. Okay, and, and they decided, I, my, uh, my problem with that is I'm a laid off teacher and I think students maybe sitting in a cafeteria one or two days a week is a lot better than 45 kids in a classroom. Um, so I know that that's not you at all, but right. that's good information. On right. Just you know, we were concerned there were parents who were starting to call the Department of Ed. Okay. Because then there's you know 990 hours of education time, and so if they were in the cafeteria two or three days a week, we started getting close to where we weren't going to meet that obligation. So that, that's a fine line. No, I understand. Another question on page six uh, on the uh, forecast for the when you do 2017, uh, the amount raised totals, you had 18 percent, 14 percent, and then it jumped more than double. Uh, and I know you're saying it was due to a bait. I thought abatements you said were in there. I just wonder why that you know, it was four and a half million dollars, and then it went down to three million. What the what the uh, reason was for that big jump? And the other part was uh, the selling of land in the city. Uh, yeah, the difference on the on the amount to be raised line are deficits, and if you've got a year where there was a snow deficit to be raised, it's included in that. In this this fiscal year, we didn't have a snow deficit to raise. That's the biggest reason for that reduction. That's that's why it goes up and down like that. Bill. That's why it's less because we didn't have as much snow removal. Yes. Yes. The other part was uh, how much money has been raised, you know, selling all these pieces of land in the city. I know they were talking about, I'm curious what the total, uh, if you knew what the income was. Well, the amount of money that's raised by selling off properties like that ends up in that, uh, if you remember back in an earlier page, was local receipts and uh, penalties and interest on taxes is included in that. So if you beat, uh, if you, you end up beating your budget on what we've assumed on that, it flows into the available funds, yeah, extra reserves. If I, if I might, call the uh, we have one, a couple pieces of property, the Howard Street, the, the school up there, and some city-owned property off of Howard Street, Route 37, going into Holbrook, that are currently in, that they're currently out, I believe, for people to bid on in the request for proposal stage. So that's money coming in that has not been has not been finalized yet. Jack, that Route 37 property that you mentioned, is that in conjunction with the proposed uh, sports complex that's going there? That is the proposed sports cut. That's it's zoned properly for sports complex. It will uh, the RFP period to submit bids, I believe, ends July 18th. I think um, I remember in this year's budget that there was about 900000 appropriated to do a master plan in terms of capital and buildings and maintenance and replacements and space and all of that. And I wondered if you could comment, is that going to move forward? And since we have such inflexibility in terms of overrides, etc., one of the issues I worry about is can the city maintain the properties that it owns now going into the future? And when cities become taken, uh, when properties become taken in tax title, for example, the two-story building on Frederick Douglass Avenue, the Grayson, they look deplorable because the city owns them, but there's no maintenance and no upkeep on them. So how do we right. manage them? Well, there's a couple questions there. The first has to do with the facilities planning study. And uh, we've appropriated a little bit of money, but the bulk of that is from a borrowing authorization that's in front of the city council now. So we'll have to see how they act on that. Uh, if, you, um, if you do a planning study for facilities upgrades, the state allows you to borrow that money. If you do the work that's anticipated in it, you can add the cost of that study to the long-term financing. If you don't do the work, then you've got to pay the borrowing back over five years. So we'll end up having to deal with that with one fashion or the other. But in the moment, it's reflected in the uh, a, a borrowing request in front of the city council. 
On the issue of um, dilapidated buildings and taking them for tax title, the biggest problem we face here, in my opinion, is first, that for many, many years, the owner may be current on taxes, but not taking care of the building. So there isn't much we can do uh, with respect to at least taxing authority until the owner becomes delinquent. Once the owner becomes delinquent, we usually move pretty aggressively to get that property back in the city's hands, but state law gives them a fair amount of rights uh, to stay ahead of that process. So if the building is in bad shape by the time they stop paying taxes, and then by the time we get the property, it's even worse shape, then you're sitting uh, on a piece of property which is a new requirement to take care of, and you don't have the money in the budget right now, as I discussed at the very beginning, to take care of the properties we already own, most of which are being used for productive purposes, whether they're school buildings or city hall or, or fire stations. So uh, I don't know a good answer to that question. Um, investment, most of these are in the old industrial part of the city or the downtown part of the city. So investment in programs that have reinvigoration through new investment outside tax investment coming in is perhaps one answer, but I don't think there's an easy answer to that because once you get a property like the old Kresge building, the cost to fix it is huge. And you know we were hoping in that case that there would be a private uh, development taking place there. So I, I don't really know a good answer to your question there, Lynn. I wish I did. Yeah, and I, again, it's it's hard to it's hard to get people to say we'll pay money to take care of a dilapidated building. You know, getting it back on the tax roll as fast as possible is, is one answer. But and there's no by the school construction match by the state. No, on no, on no. The, you're you're, you're on your own on that one. So I remember saying something a while back about the mayor um, bringing in um, people to the downtown area to, um, you know, bring in business and bring, you know, to revamp the city. So there's, are you saying that if someone owns the, those buildings currently, there's nothing that the city can do to say, hey, you need to, you know, keep this up, you know, make it look nice? Well, uh, you probably need to talk to the building department more than the finance guy as to whether there's any real city clout, but if, from, from the areas I'm responsible for, if the person is, is, is current on his taxes, uh, unless he's got code violations, uh, and even then I don't know that you often got the ability, we, we have an attorney in the room, I want to be a little bit careful here, but uh, property rights are constitutionally protected. I think that's, that, that's where I come from. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Property rights are constitutionally protected. So you're talking about stepping in front of a constitutionally protected right if, as a city, you try to do something with a property that somebody owns. Now, you've got some avenues where you can do it, but they're not wide open. You've got some restrictions there. Um, if a city becomes vibrant in its downtown because people are willing to come in and invest, then those properties flip over to people that want them to do productive things to them. And what's hard in Brockton has been to find the formula to get that kind of investment to come down. It's not for lack of trying. Over the years, there have been a number of approaches, whether it's residential, whether it's government center work like the courthouse. But you've got the biggest problem, I think, is it's not easy to get to downtown from the highways. It has to be rail-based. The city was built to be a railroad city. The railroad goes north to south, and that's where the old industrial section was, and all the workers housing alongside that. So it's hard to figure out what that answer really is. And we got caught up in a couple of different tidal waves uh, with the movement of the high school, the mall taking a lot of downtown, and just changes in society where people want to be in their cars and driving to places as opposed to walking neighborhoods. So downtown's a tough problem. They're trying to make progress on it, but it really is step by step. It's not, not an easy one. But we don't have an awful lot of avenues we can step in front of a person's right to own his property and do with it what he chooses, I think. Some restrictions on that. Is that okay, uh, Councillor? <laughs> Any other questions? No. Right. I do. Uh, I do want to thank Councillor Sullivan and Councillor Asac who, who showed up, and uh, also I want to recognize Scott Vecchi, who's running for uh, running for sheriff. Thank you for coming. Uh, if there are no other questions, um,
thank you all for coming. Please feel free to take a water. And I believe there's a notebook over there if you want to, uh, to sign in for you with your name, possibly your phone number, and your email if you want to be alerted of future events like this, you know, like another ward meeting to let you know about. All right. Thank you all for coming.